Kingdom Hearts 1 will forever hold a special place in my heart. It was one of the only PS2 games I had growing up. Although it certainly hasn't aged the best, I still always enjoy my time with it. There's just a certain charm to this early PS2 era attempt at an action RPG with a large world. There's a lot of little things most people playing this game nowadays easily miss, and that's partially why I'm making this video. Before we start though, I just want to give a huge shout out to Cybershell for inspiring this concept. That Super Mario RPG Secrets video was really special to me. You could tell that he had a lot of love and passion for the game, and there's something about that that I just really adore. So I figured I would try doing something like that myself, so let me know if you like this format. Alright, now everyone who's played this game at least one time has gone through the dive into the heart section and had to choose one of the three weapons. But what a lot of people don't know is you can actually reobtain both the Dream Shield and the Dream Rod. The Dream Shield can be obtained for Goofy by collecting all of the elemental arts from the White Mushrooms. In order to obtain these, you need to use three of the same type of spell on a mushroom when it asks for it. It can actually be a pretty good shield for Goofy as it's one of the only shields that raises his MP. The Dream Rod can be obtained for Donald by having all final tier magic spells. Unfortunately, however, there's no way to reobtain the Dream Sword. It honestly would have been really cool if you could like synthesize it again, but alas, there's no such way. You can actually lose the duels against the other kids on Destiny Islands by simply walking too far away from them. I think some players encountered this by accidentally jumping off the island you fight Riku on. Another interesting thing is you can actually duel all three of the kids on Destiny Islands on the second day. Titus brings up that Riku did the same thing and beat all of them. That's another thing I always really enjoyed about Kingdom Hearts 1, the way they set up Riku as your rival. I always liked how the game kept score between you and Riku. Kinda wish it came up again when you fought him again in Hollow Bastion. During your first visit to Traverse Town, after meeting Leon and Yuffie, if you head back to the first district, you can get a free Mega Potion from Aerith. This is actually something I didn't even know until I was capturing footage for this game. Like most of the other facts I included in this video, I knew beforehand, but this one I literally just stumbled upon by accident. So here it is. This is a really weird one. If you hit the bell in the lobby of Traverse Town Hotel three times, then a text box will show up saying no vacancies. I don't even know why this is here, it doesn't serve a purpose or give you an item or anything. I'm pretty sure most people even forget that this area exists in Traverse Town, so it's just really funny to me that they even bothered to include something like this. During the encounter with the card soldiers in Wonderland, you can actually hit the queen to briefly distract the cards. She even does a little attack if you get too close to her. There's just something so funny to me about including something like this. Like why would Sora even go up and hit the queen? There's a few notable early game fights the player can lose with no consequence. Most players probably experience this against Leon or Cloud, but you can also lose the first fight against Sabor in Deep Jungle. If you do actually manage to beat Leon the first time, he'll give you an elixir before you leave Traverse Town. You can also lose against Darkseid and dive into the heart. Did you know that you can skip the Jungle Slide minigame in Deep Jungle by just opening the menu and hitting quit? Here's one that's always been super funny to me. There are several bosses in Kingdom Hearts 1 that you can just walk away from. Like every other game in the series, most bosses will trap you in the room you fight them in, but there's a few that just don't for some reason. This works on the first phase of Clayton, Oogie's Manor, and Captain Hook. Again, I couldn't really tell you why this is a thing other than being a potential oversight, but it's incredibly funny to me nonetheless. There's a special cutscene with Pinocchio prior to Monstro. I believe it can be triggered any time after entering Agrabah for the first time. It's a cute little scene, but it honestly brings up the question of how the fuck this kid even ended up in Monstro. Upon visiting Neverland for the first time, Sora's shadow is stolen, and this change is actually reflected in-game with the shadow no longer being visible. This change is actually reflected in all worlds, not just Neverland. Again, it's another super cool detail that I can't believe I missed until this playthrough. His shadow will only return once you beat Anti-Sora. I know in reality it's probably not too hard to just disable Sora's shadow, but I still think it's an incredibly cool detail. Speaking of Neverland, if the player somehow manages to finish Neverland before entering Monstro, then all cutscenes involving Riku will be dramatically altered. This even has a slight gameplay ramification as Riku will no longer fight with you during the first fight against Parasite Cage. I'll leave a link in the description below so you guys can see these differences more thoroughly. Honestly, this is an incredibly cool detail and kind of subtle foreshadowing for a Kingdom Hearts game. 
It made me kind of realize how much more open Kingdom Hearts 1 is compared to the other games in the series. Monstro, Atlantica, and Halloween Town can all be completely avoided if the player wanted to. It's just kind of a neat thing I appreciate about this game a lot more nowadays. In the dining room of the Dalmatian's house, one of the Dalmatians will actually follow you around the room. Something about this incredibly low poly puppy just fills my heart with joy. Kingdom Hearts 1 is a lot of pretty well hidden chests and items you can find throughout all the worlds. And I'm not going to sit here and go over every single one, but here's a few of my favorites. In Hollow Bastion's waterway, there's a pretty sneakily hidden chest here near the entrance. In Wonderland, if you enter the rabbit hole, a bunch of enemies will spawn and killing them will reward you with a chest with a mega potion. It even plays a little jingle to signify that you've unlocked something. If you hit the pipe on top of Pooh's house, then it'll drop a mega potion inside his home. One of the things I really do like about Kingdom Hearts 1 compared to most of the other games in the series is just how much you can interact with the environment. You can honestly find a good amount of secrets in the game by just hitting stuff with your keyblade at random. I really do miss how much Kingdom Hearts 1 rewarded the player for experimenting with their environments. Like these bubbles in Hollow Bastion you can cast Blizzard on. This one I actually couldn't get footage of, but there are special chests that spawn in the clock tower at certain times of the day. I believe it's every 12th hour. The items you get are actually incredibly good, such as Ori Calcum or Mega Elixirs or Attacker Defense Ups, but I couldn't get any to spawn. So you're just gonna have to take my word for it that these exist. I think it sort of gets underplayed just how much the Final Fantasy series is consistently referenced in Kingdom Hearts. There's a few obvious examples, like the magic spells in their different tiers, and obviously the actual Final Fantasy characters featured within the series. But there's a lot of smaller ones I feel like people miss. For instance, most of the gummy ship blueprints are direct references to the Final Fantasy series, such as this Cactuar blueprint or this Chocobo one, or my personal favorite, this Alexander blueprint. Sora's ability, Zon Tetsuken, is a direct reference to Odin's classic summon attack. Donald's ultimate weapon, Save the Queen, is a reference to a reoccurring weapon in the Final Fantasy series, although it's most commonly associated with General Beatrix from Final Fantasy IX. The Behemoth Heartless is an homage to the reoccurring Behemoth enemy in the series. Goofy's Genji Shield weapon is a reference to an extremely common armor set in the series. During the Destiny Islands prologue, Sora and Riku discuss what to name the ship, with Riku suggesting the name Highwind, a reference to the common ship name in the series, while Sora suggests the name Excalibur, which is another extremely common weapon in the series. Lastly, Sora's Diamond Dust Cable is an obvious homage to Shiva's attack. Again, a lot of these might be more obvious to some people, but I've known a lot of Kingdom Hearts fans in my days that just know nothing about the Final Fantasy series, so I thought these were worth mentioning. Alright, now let's get into the stuff Disney higher-ups cared about the most during Kingdom Hearts development. That's right, baby, I'm talking about the merchandise! So prior to Kingdom Hearts' release in North America, Mirage Toys began working on a line of Kingdom Hearts figures. I actually managed to dig up some extremely early mock-ups and prototypes thanks to Gaming Intelligence Agency. There's a lot in these mock-ups that actually change pretty drastically. A lot of the characters shown here wouldn't end up making the cut, like Clayton, Ursula, the Queen of Hearts, and the Cheshire Cat. Probably the most interesting one, though, is they had plans to make a figure based on Mickey Mouse. This obviously didn't pan out since Mickey Mouse is barely in Kingdom Hearts 1, but it's interesting to see that they had plans to do this regardless. They even had plans to make hero and villain bundles. It's kind of interesting to see Riku included among the heroes, despite the fact that he takes a more antagonistic role for most of Kingdom Hearts 1. Also, for some reason they wanted to include the Cheshire Cat among the villains? Now, I would almost say that this kind of makes sense given the context of KH1's Alice in Wonderland story. But as I mentioned earlier, they already were planning on making a figure based on the Queen of Hearts, so I don't know why they didn't just include her in the bundle. These mock-ups are also shown using very early models for Sora, Riku, and Kairi. Interestingly though, these early character models were actually still used for the official release of these figures, which I should probably get into now because they are fucking weird. The first series released with six different sets. To start, we have Sora and Jack who were bundled together for some reason. Riku and Captain Hook, which is honestly like the only one that really makes sense. Kairi and Maleficent. Donald and an air soldier, Goofy and a tiny version of the guard armor, which funnily enough were at some point switched around before release according to the mock-ups. And finally, what I think is the funniest one by far, Darkseid and Pluto. 
I don't know, it's just such a bizarre combination of characters. Now the actual build quality of these figures are pretty decent, with the big exception being the actual Kingdom Hearts characters themselves. Sora probably got it the worst, with him looking especially off-model. The actual Disney characters in the Heartless both actually look pretty good for the time. The set was actually popular enough to spawn a second series, this time featuring more of the Disney party members and summons, alongside a mermaid Sora. You can definitely tell their build quality went up as this Sora looks significantly better than the original monstrosity. The most interesting figure in this lineup though has to be this Riku Ansem, which is mistakenly referred to as Heartless Riku. Not sure why they decided to pair him up with Jafar of all characters, but it's still pretty cool nonetheless. Now this is easily the rarest and most sought after figure of these sets due to the fact that this is the only figure of Riku Ansem I think they've ever made. I always saw these figures in eBay auctions as a kid but never wanted to buy any of them just because they looked so bad. There was also Tomy's Disney Magical Collection. Now these were a Japanese exclusive set of figures released in the early 2000s that mostly covered classic and modern Disney properties, but there were a few Kingdom Hearts figures that released in this set. They even made figures for Sora, Donald, and Goofy's Halloween Town appearances. I actually had both the Halloween Town Sora and Halloween Town Goofy figures as a kid, but I've long since lost them. There's also this really cool Kingdom Hearts Jigsaw puzzle released only in Japan with this incredibly nice detailed art featuring pretty much every prominent Disney character in the story. Kingdom Hearts Final Mix was first released in Japan and received a special collector's edition, usually referred to online as the Platinum Edition. It came with a special platinum themed box art, a little Sora figurine, a calendar, and these little button pins, as well as a few other little goodies. It's a cute little bundle and not too expensive if you're interested in owning it. Kingdom Hearts also had a manga tie-in, first released in October 25th, 2003, with art drawn by Shiro Amano, who previously worked on a Legend of Mana manga. It's a pretty cute little series covering the events of the first game. It even got its own Final Mix edition with some additional chapters. I'm actually a pretty big fan of Amano's art. I'm a really big fan of their expression work, especially. They also do a fantastic job representing the Disney characters. I especially like their cover pages, which feature Sora, Donald, and Goofy interacting more with the Disney worlds. Unfortunately though, I don't think Square Enix has properly re-released these mangas in any form. I actually own Volume 1 of the original manga series, which is partially why I even know this stuff exists. This manga series is actually still going strong, with series based on Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, 358 Days Over 2, Kingdom Hearts 2, and 3 all being released. Now Kingdom Hearts is a pretty big franchise now, so it's probably not too surprising to a lot of people that stuff like this exists, but I still find a lot of this stuff pretty interesting considering it was all made in the context of Kingdom Hearts being one game and not a huge series. Probably the most fascinating piece of media to come from this was a Kingdom Hearts animated TV series pilot created by Seth Kearsley, who previously directed 8 Crazy Nights. This pilot was actually uploaded by Seth himself and would be quickly taken down, although it's thankfully been archived and is extremely easy to find. It is an extremely fascinating watch, and I want to leave a link in the description below to Seth's video talking about its production. You should also check out his website, he's selling these incredible 8 Crazy Nights X Kingdom Hearts stickers. Now for the stuff I always find the most interesting when researching games, and that's the cut content. Sora has two publicly known early designs. The first and earliest known design for Sora featured a human-lion hybrid and a chainsaw weapon. Interestingly, the keychain attached to the chainsaw weapon seems to be a direct reference to Squall's Griever symbol. I always kind of wish that this design would come back in some form. I always thought this design also very closely resembled the art Nomura made for FF7. The second publicly known early design was actually featured in the pre-order art book for Kingdom Hearts 1.5. Although this design still features the lion tail, it definitely more closely resembles the final. It even has a finalized Keyblade design. These first two designs are pretty well known, but there's a ton of other concept art for Kingdom Hearts 1 that's not as widely publicized. Most of it coming from the actual Kingdom Hearts design document that was posted in 2015. One early piece of concept art shows Sora and Riku wielding the Keyblade by its chain to attack Heartless. It's honestly a really cool idea and I'm surprised no other Kingdom Hearts game really revisited this. Although Sora using the chain would actually finally come to fruition in Kingdom Hearts 4, with Sora seemingly using the chain to grapple onto various objects. Another piece of concept art shows Sora in a loincloth like Tarzan, seemingly implying that he was going to change appearances more to fit worlds. On the same page, you can also see an early design for what Sora's Halloween Town outfit looked like. 
The design doc also shows off what the cut Toy Story world may have looked like. Toy Story isn't the only cut world that's been referenced in Kingdom Hearts. A world based on the Lion King was cut due to time restraints and technical limitations, although this world would finally be realized in Kingdom Hearts 2. Something that still hasn't made its way into Kingdom Hearts though is a world based on the Jungle Book. A level based on the Jungle Book was initially planned for Kingdom Hearts 1 but was rejected in favor of Deep Jungle. Which to me is honestly just incredibly sad that a world that they literally can never talk about again in Kingdom Hearts got rejected over a pretty famous and well-loved Disney movie. More infamously though, a world based on the Jungle Book was also set to appear in Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, but would again ultimately be cut. Unlike Kingdom Hearts 1 though, there was actually progress made in this world with a few maps being made for it. I honestly don't know at this point if the Jungle Book will ever make it into Kingdom Hearts, but I honestly hope it does because it just consistently seems to get shafted from the series. A world based on Atlantis the Lost Empire was also cut, apparently due to not fitting into the game's story very well. There's a few other interesting details featured in this design doc, such as this incredibly gothic early art of Hollow Bastion and some early Heartless designs. If you'd like a more thorough look into the design doc, I'd recommend checking out the article by KH Insider. Huge shoutouts to them for preserving this design doc. Kingdom Hearts 1 would first be revealed to the public during E3 2001. There's plenty of notable differences, but here are a few of the smaller ones first. Sora, Riku, and Kairi are all clearly using very early models compared to their final versions, while Donald and Goofy are shown wearing different outfits entirely wearing the outfits they are typically seen wearing in non-Kingdom Hearts games. Interestingly, they actually are shown wearing these outfits very briefly during the game's credits, which most likely implies that this is where these models were used. The magic menu originally showed how much MP each spell cost. In the final game, all the spells shown here, Fire, Blizzard, Thunder, and Cure, all only cost 1 MP. However, this trailer seems to imply that they all would have had variable cost, with Thunder costing the most at 3 MP. The only spells that cost more than 1 MP in the final game are Arrow and Stop. I honestly can't imagine how much more difficult KH1 would have been if you had to expend 2 MP bars just to heal yourself, so this was definitely a change made for the better. At one point in the trailer you can briefly see a shot of Riku on top of the Neverland Clock Tower, something which never happens in the final game. Interestingly though, almost 10 years later, a scene featuring Riku in the Neverland Clock Tower would eventually be featured in Kingdom Hearts Recoded, although it's unknown if this scene has any relation to the one featured in the original trailer. During several parts of the trailer, we can actually see Sora running around Disney Castle, which isn't possible in the final game. According to Jun Akiyama, one of Kingdom Hearts' original writers, the reason for its removal was as follows. Since that place is purely Disney, we were not planning to have Sora and other original characters like him go there from the beginning. We had End of the World, the source of Heartless, reside on the opposite side of the castle to show that Disney Castle is a place untouched by Heartless. In this same interview, he also mentions that Monstro was originally planned as a boss but was cut due to programming complications. This idea would later come to fruition in Birth by Sleep with Monstro becoming a super boss in the Mirage Arena. The classic Final Fantasy summon Bahama was apparently meant to appear in the game. Via hacking, you can make his name appear in the game's summon menu, but the game will crash if you try to summon him. It would have been a really nice homage to the Final Fantasy series, and I personally would have just loved to see what he looked like in this game. Riku from Final Fantasy X was originally occupying Yuffie's role in the story before being switched. She was even supposed to use the exact same design as seen by this early concept art of her. I haven't been able to find an exact source as to why she was cut, but if I had to guess it probably has something to do with the fact that there would be two major characters in the game both named Riku. A version of Riku based on her appearance in Final Fantasy X-2 would eventually appear in Kingdom Hearts 2. I always thought these versions of the characters were really weird. Just these bizarre little pixie creatures that come out of nowhere with no real explanation. They even got their own special keyblade despite having basically nothing to do with the game's story at all. The final boss fight against Ansem originally had a phase where the player would fight Riku again, with the arena for this boss fight still being left in the game's code. If I had to guess this would probably replace with the fight against Darkseid, but that's just an educated guess more than anything. Riku isn't the only character that changed during development. Apparently Irvine from Final Fantasy VIII was replaced by Waka. 
Which just makes me wonder why they wanted the character who uses a fucking shotgun in Kingdom Hearts, but that's probably related to why he got cut. I guess he wouldn't be too out of place considering Clayton also just blasts Sora with a shotgun. Probably one of my favorite things involves this piece of concept art for the original final boss. This final boss fight apparently would have been against Chernabog in Hollow Bastion. This is an idea so early in development you can even see Sora, Donald, and Goofy's early designs here. While obviously this idea was scrapped pretty early on, Chernabog would appear as a boss in Kingdom Hearts 1, most likely as an homage to this original idea. There's a few other interesting little things I could mention, like this early art of Destiny Islands featuring these water slides. You can also see these water slides in the design doc, like I mentioned. Or these super expressive character sheets for Sora, Riku, and Kairi. I honestly really love the art in these, they really give off very classic Disney vibes. Kinda wish we had more stuff in Kingdom Hearts that looked like this. I'm not really sure where to put this last fact, but when asked if there were certain things Disney vetoed for the project, Nomura claimed that he wanted Walt Disney in the game. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not he's joking, because I truly don't know. That's about all the interesting cut content about the game that I've been able to find, but before I end this video, I briefly want to discuss the version differences. Kingdom Hearts has been re-released a significant number of times, with each version having a lot of notable changes, so let's start with the Japanese version. Right out the gate, the original release of Kingdom Hearts had no difficulty options, which does kinda make sense considering most RPGs at the time didn't have any, so by default, all playthroughs of the original Kingdom Hearts are on normal mode. During the fight with Chernabog, the iconic song Night on Bald Mountain was not actually present in the Japanese version. Instead, it just plays the typical boss theme Squirming Evil. The original release of Kingdom Hearts also had connectivity with the PlayStation Broadband Navigator. This was a Japanese-only peripheral that allowed for a ton of different features, one of which was being able to download games onto an HDD to allow for faster load times. This feature was removed from all English releases due to the accessory not being made available outside of Japan. Probably the most well-known major difference between the English and Japanese releases was the addition of three new super bosses, those being Ice Titan, Kurt Ziza, and Sephiroth. Adding new super bosses to Western releases was actually sort of a tradition. The original Japanese release of Final Fantasy VII did not include boss fights against the Emerald and Ruby weapons. A similar situation happened to Final Fantasy X with its Dark Aeon boss fights and penance. These versions would eventually be released in Japan, known as Final Fantasy VII International and Final Fantasy X International respectively. Now onto Final Mix, which released less than a year after the original Kingdom Hearts and barely a month after Kingdom Hearts had already debuted in America. This version retains some of the differences found in the Western release, along with a plethora of new content and changes of its own. For starters, almost every Heartless was recolored. I'm not really sure why they did this, but it's kinda neat. Guard Armor definitely got it the worst though, I don't know why they decided to give him actual clown colors. In addition, every world in the game now contains its own special heart list. Most of these guys require certain gimmicks to defeat, like this mushroom you have to use stop on, or this little guy you have to follow. All of these new heart lists drop new synthesis materials used for new items in the synth shop. These new heart lists are easily my least favorite addition of Final Mix. The only thing they really did was make getting the ultimate weapon significantly more grindy. Sora got two new Keyblades, Diamond Dust for beating Ice Titan, and One Winged Angel for beating Sephiroth. Donald and Goofy also got a few new weapons. Quite a few new combat abilities were added, most notably Sliding Dash and Slapshot, which definitely helped improve combat significantly. Both would go on to return in Kingdom Hearts 2. Finally, and one of my least favorite changes involves the Wooden Sword. In the original game, the Wooden Sword actually did damage to some of the Heartless and Hollow Bastion. This would be changed in Final Mix, and I really don't understand why. I honestly thought the idea that Sora was actually getting strong enough to hurt the Heartless with the Toy Sword was pretty cool, so I'm not sure why they felt this was something worth changing. Now onto the version released as part of Kingdom Hearts 1.5. Aside from the obvious fidelity increase, 1.5 changed a major gameplay feature of the original Kingdom Hearts. In the original, whenever Sora had to interact with context-sensitive things like chests, or activate one of his limit breaks, you had to scroll down to the question mark on the bottom that would change depending on the situation. 1.5 made it so that all of these effects are activated via the triangle button like Kingdom Hearts 2. This is easily the most welcome change as it makes the game significantly less cumbersome to play. 
The soundtrack would also be completely reorchestrated. The last major difference comes from Sora, Riku, and Ansem's character models. Square Enix has infamously lost the source code to many of its most iconic games, which has made porting them a pretty difficult process. One of the casualties was Sora, Riku, and Ansem's original character models, with them now being replaced by their models from Dream Drop Distance. Now while I don't particularly mind this change too much, it is extremely sad that Square Enix just lost such an important piece of video game history. A similar issue occurred with Final Fantasy X's remaster, with several of its character faces having to be completely redone for its HD port. Even after all these years, Kingdom Hearts is still one of my favorite franchises. It's an extremely fascinating oddity of a series that never fails to entertain me in some way. In recent years, I feel like a lot of discussion of Kingdom Hearts has been solely focused on its absurd story, when I think there's still a lot to appreciate about the core games. Like I said at the beginning, even though there's a lot that's still pretty outdated about Kingdom Hearts, I still think there's plenty of merit to playing it nowadays. And to me, that's really the basis of why I made this video. Because I still think that there's a lot to appreciate about Kingdom Hearts that gets kind of mired in constant online cynicism. I have quite a few other games that I'd like to make a video in the same vein as this, so let me know if you'd like to see any of those. But that's about all I have for this video. So thanks for watching, and remember... Yes, but one, one, happy faces! Happy?